you guys do so well. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. What do you hold on to in this life so dearly that if it were taken from you, you'd be utterly devastated? Would it be a favorite heirloom that was passed down from generation to generation? A treasured childhood toy that you love so dearly, maybe your favorite blankie. Something that's valuable and sentimental to you in your past. What if it was taken from you? Would you be devastated? Because you hold on to it so tightly. How about the many different relationships that we have in life? What if you lost a very close friend? How about your family? Like your spouse, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews? Imagine for a second they were taken from you. A terrible thought, right? And it's a fear that I'm sure we all have had. And since we have those fears, what do we do? We hold on even tighter. We cherish them even more. We hold on with all our might. And with all those attachments, all those things that we hold on to, and all those relationships we have and we love so much, comes with fears. We're afraid of getting sick. We're afraid of our children getting sick. We're afraid of our parents getting older and feeble and, and going downhill. We're afraid of our own mortality. And with all those fears running through our minds, Jesus gives us something that only he, the very one who overcame death, our greatest enemy, he is the only one who can bring us peace from all those fears. And today we see again how Jesus' resurrection is for me. All the blessings he has to offer. Because Jesus is alive for your peace and for my peace. Christ is risen. He is risen in me. Hallelujah. You were wondering if I was going to leave that out. See, I tricked you. Now, there are two kinds of people in this world. You can simplify things. I mean, you can get complicated if you want to. But it's really simple. Either you believe in Jesus, or you don't. Believers, unbelievers, it's never changed. And that's what Jesus is really addressing in our text today. Unbelievers wouldn't give one iota if the word of God is destroyed. To them, it's just another book. Right? Just some, some fanciful writings, just some, some history book that might have some good rules, that's a nice guidebook. But if an unbeliever lost that, it wouldn't matter. But what about for you and me? What if we lost the word? How tragic would it be if we were banned from reading the Bible? If we were caught from reading the Bible, we could be put to death. What if every written word, every Bible app, every, everything that's related to God's word was forbidden? And don't ever think it can, it can never happen. Because it can. In fact, a lot of countries all lot Christianity. And yet, Christianity is still tries. I wonder if Christians in our country had that word God taken away from them, would they miss it? Have we at times taken that word God for granted? Would we respond any differently than the unbeliever? Would we miss that, that vital piece of our lives, that very word of God? It's an intriguing thought, isn't it? It's something that, that takes self-examination for each one of us to realize, do I truly cherish the Word of God as much as He cherishes me? And would I really miss it? The reason I bring that up is because there was a video that came out in 2012 of new believers in China. And this box is delivered, it's only about a minute long, and the box is laid down in front of a whole bunch of adults. And one lady goes to open it, and everyone floods around her. They're waiting to see what's inside in brand new Bibles. And they put them in their hands, and they are just crying and weeping, and they're laughing, and it's all about joy. Because they've been given the greatest gift anyone could ever receive. The Bible is the greatest gift you and I could ever receive. And I wonder if we would respond the same way. 
Or does it just collect dust on our shelf? Or is it an app that rarely gets used? Sadly, we take that word for granted, don't we? And yet the word itself says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's law, isn't it? It can see what, what, what we think God can't see. And nothing can be hidden from God's sight. And it not only convicts us in our sins for those times that we have taken the word of God for granted, and we've become complacent in our lives, and we don't think spiritual is that important, and it leads us to the one who came to forgive us. It leads us to see Christ, the one who's risen for you and for me. And the whole world needs to hear, to see, to read this word. It's that vitally important. One of the disciples, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, saw the importance of Jesus showing himself to the disciples, and he asked this question it's directly before our text this morning. He said, But Lord... Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? You see, Judas and the rest of the disciples were wondering why Jesus was pouring out all this information to them, all this wisdom, and yet in closed quarters at times. Wasn't he going to show himself to the world as well? They couldn't see the whole picture at this point. Some of them still thought that it was that political kingdom that had come to free them from the hands of the Romans. They didn't realize that Jesus came not just for a, physical, not for a physical kingdom, but for a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus' answer is our text, okay? And it's not what they were expecting. Judas is saying, why don't you show yourself to the world? And then he, he follows it up with this. He says, if anyone loves me, he'll hold on to my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus is answering the question. In other words, Jesus is saying that he shows himself through that very word of God. Again, the greatest treasure given to you by your parents is not an inheritance, not the finest education the world can offer, or a roof over your heads, but it's the very word of God where you get to see Jesus. What did Paul say in Romans? Faith comes from hearing the messages, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. How many people today are spiritual, but have no idea who Jesus is? <clears throat> Too many, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He tells the disciples, I have shown myself. And those who love me will do what? They will follow my word. And there's a promise attached to it, too. When we follow his word, as we love him through the power of the Holy Spirit... The promise is that God the Father and Jesus will make their home in the hearts of those who believe. Live and follow that word daily. And those who follow that word are those who get to see Jesus and love him by holding on to that word. Stop and think about those things that you hold on to this, in this life. But if you lost, you'd be devastated. And ask yourself, would I treat the word of God in the same way? If I lost this today, would my heart be broken? Or is it too readily available? I can just go pick it up on another shelf, right? Because they're sold all over the place. I can just pick it up on my Bible. Is that a good thing? Not always, right? What does that word tell us? We love because he first loved us. Loving Jesus means following his word and holding on to that word. Jesus said this about unbelievers. The one who does not love me does not hold on to my words. He was speaking directly to the Pharisees and teachers of the law of the day. They saw Jesus. They heard his preaching. They could have connected the dots and saw that he was the chosen Messiah, but they didn't. They heard the word, and they rejected him. Atheists. Skeptics. Philosophers of this age refuse to listen to the word of God. Because they think it's foolish. If you can't measure it, if logic can't make sense of it, if you can't see it, it doesn't it go if it goes against logical reasoning, then they can't believe. Jesus revealed himself. He reveals himself through his word, but they reject. 
give thanks to God that he revealed himself to you and to me. And he reveals himself through that word. And he empowers us through that word, the Holy Spirit, to strengthen our faith, to live each and every day for him. He has called you by the gospel. He's enlightened you with his gifts. And he, he, he calls you to follow him, to follow that word, and to tra treat it as a treasure. And it must have been so difficult for the disciples to know that eventually Jesus was going to leave them and suffer this terrible ordeal at the very hands of those religious leaders. He was about to die on the cross. He would rise again, and he was ascended to the throne. And yet, he wasn't going to leave them. Just as he hasn't left you or me. He would still be with them. He still is with us because he sent us that wonderful gift. Which we're going to celebrate next week, so I don't want to go too much into it. Next week is kind of tough. He said, I have told you these things while staying with you, but the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. Everything Jesus told the disciples would be reinforced by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they would need that. Because they faced an uphill challenge. They faced a lot of persecution. All of them were put to death besides John. And they need that Holy Spirit to remind them of God's grace. Everything Jesus said. And we still have that Holy Spirit today working through that word to teach us all things. And to give us that peace that we so desperately need. In a world of chaos, you guys see the world getting worse and worse around us. And we know that Christ is coming. He's coming soon. The Word is there to, to give us that peace of forgiveness, that peace of salvation, all those things that can just let all that stuff just melt into the background. I always think of Psalm 46 when, when things are getting chaotic. And God says, be still and know that I am God. Circumstances in your life might be changing around you constantly, but God remains the same, steady, sure, steadfast, right? A woman lay dying, and a minister sat beside her and tried to break the news as gently as he could. He said, they think your time is short. Yes, yeah, she said, I know it. Well, have you made your peace with God? <clears throat> no, she replied. I haven't made my peace with God. Then you're not afraid to die? No. Do you realize that in a few hours you're going to meet God? Yes. And you've not made your peace with God? But no, I'm not going to, she said. There is a strange light of perfect peace in the woman's eyes. And the minister realized that there was something back of it all. And he said, what do you mean? She said, listen. I know I'm dying, yet I have no fear of meeting God. I am resting in the peace which Jesus Christ made in his atoning death upon the cross. I don't have to make peace with my God, for I am resting in the peace which Jesus Christ has already made. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Have you made your peace with God? You get your house in order? It's already been done. Christ has made that peace with us and the Father. That's the peace that Christ gives us. Our sins no longer separate us from Him. That grand canyon that we can never cross on our own, no matter how we try, no matter how we climb the ladder, no matter how much we bargain with God, we have been brought to Him through Jesus. And that's the peace that He gives us. All our sins are truly forgiven. And you know that even on your deathbeds, there is nothing to fear is Christ of God. You find rest from all your anxiety and fear in the loving arms of your Savior Jesus who embraces you with forgiveness. All those fears we have about the things that we have in this life, if we lost them, all the fears that we have when it comes to our family members can all be put to rest by the resurrection of your Savior Jesus. To know that He already took on all our greatest enemies. There is no reason to be afraid. Listen again to Jesus' words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let it be afraid. When I hear those words, I think about all the self-help books out there and how people try to get help by having them turn inward. And Christ is saying, you know what? Don't look inward, look upward. Look to me. Don't be afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I am coming to you. This is John chapter 14. The first six verses is where he says, I am going to my father's house. In that house are many rooms. And if I were not coming back, I would have told you, but I'm coming back to, to, to take you to be with me, right? And then he goes on to say, I'm the way, the truth, and life. And now he says these words, don't be afraid. He says, if you love me, you'd be glad that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so when it does happen, you may believe. And that will be fulfilled next week when we get to celebrate the Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came to the disciples and empowered them with that faith to do miracles, to spread the word of God despite persecution, and empowered them to live for Christ. You're going to hear that next week as we celebrate the Pentecost and remember that the resurrection is for our unity. So Jesus has gone up to heaven for you. He's prepared a place for you. He'll come back to take you to be with him someday. Is that something to hold on to? Doesn't that give you peace? Absolutely. That's the greatest message that Christ could give any one of us. Jesus is alive for our peace. Amen. Please stand. May that wonderful peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, so guard and keep your minds from faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So we'll sing the to today of Laudamus, you are God, and note that I will sing the verses and the congregation responds with, we praise you, we sing an endless praise, and then go back to the, you sing the refrain together as well.
please stand.
special offering in the back is a military camp for Lutheran military support group. Uh, help, so they help support uh, our current military and also our veterans. Uh, it's a group put together for remembering primarily our veterans and those serving our forces. So that box will be in the back, and that offering will go directly to Lutheran military support group. Um, I was approached by someone this last week about uh, exchange students coming over uh, for a week or two, I believe, and they're looking for host families and we're going to all the different churches. It's, I think, more of like a, an immersion type, get to know the culture of America type program. So if anyone's interest in, interested in that, the sheet is on the bulletin board in the back. They need an answer by Wednesday. They give me short notice. What country are they coming? Uh, well, the guy's name is Pavel Olivov. They're coming from all different uh, areas of Europe. They're college students. Uh, information on the sheet can explain more. Um, so I think he did. He came to church last year. He seemed very familiar to me. But of course, a lot was going on last year. Um, so we need to know by Wednesday if that's something you're interested in doing. He said basically they need, their, they need to be there for a place to sleep because they're going to be gone most of the day from morning till evening. And they're going to be taking them throughout uh, uh, California and just introducing them to a lot of different things in the United States. Okay, so um, don't forget church picnic is July 14th. I believe we have some sign-up sheets out there now um, for uh, Dish the Pass. It's going to be at the Duff's house. And we'll be getting uh, the address for you, for those who don't know where the Duffs are. And uh, so what will happen is we'll have church, and around, I think it's at noon or 1 o'clock, we go over to the Duffs and have a picnic. So that's uh, picnic July 14th. And last but not least, I started a Bible study with a young lady who came with her four children and her husband. Um, the young lady has asked to uh, be baptized along with her four children. And they're from the Air Force Base, they're actually Army. And I'm taking them through Bible study on sort of a, like a speed up process because they're only here for a year. But um, I'm doing that Tuesday and Thursday at roughly 11. Uh, they have a child with autism. And so that child goes to therapy in Vacaville. That's the time that we figured would be a good time to sit down and have Bible study. And so if anyone is more than welcome to come and brush up on your your basic Bible skills and grow in the faith and welcome this young lady, uh, God willing, into the church. Um, that's Monday and Thursday at around 11 o'clock, 11.30, somewhere in that time frame. Um, and in the future, this fall, I'll be doing a similar thing, but we'll probably have a night class. We'll start up Bible information classes and try to recruit people to come that would be interested in joining our church and learning more about us. And to grow in your faith and to go back to the basics. Yeah? Isn't it Tuesday or Thursday? That's what I said, Tuesday and Thursday, right? I was on the road for 17 hours in the last two days. Cut me some slack. <laughs> and you did, yeah. Tuesday and Thursday, roughly around 11 to 11.30 is when she comes. And it's about an hour and 15 minute class. Yes, Marty. A couple of things. Um, looks like we've got a church council meeting on Monday the 10th. Okay. Is that what we decided on? Yeah, pretty much. I'll morning. get that on the calendar. Yeah. And to get that calendar out next to you next week when June starts. And so. the, the other thing is, is um, somebody has a birthday tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have a birthday tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear pastor. Happy birthday. strikes, there's often a rapid mobilization to bring food, water, and shelter. But there's also an emotional and spiritual need that's just as critical. And that need is met by people, volunteers like you, who bring both labor and love. 
because when lives are devastated, people need the comfort of the gospel as well as Christian love and compassion. When the final path of Hurricane Michael became clear, some people could not evacuate in time. Longtime resident Carmen Shirley felt helpless as the roof over her head was torn away. And we were running from one end of the house to the other, just trying to get away from the roof ripping off and tree limbs coming in and then sucking back out. Our furniture was just going around in circles out here on the porch, hitting the windows. And it was survival at that point. After the storm passed, the real challenge emerged. Today, months later, Carmen still doesn't have a decent roof over her head. And it does have a mold smell, but they're like, no, especially with your husband with lung cancer, you need to get that out. Well, I think we could honestly help. Responding to Carmen's need and the needs of many others was a team of volunteers from Wells Christian Aid and Relief. Tim Peterson. Kim Miller. Dave Matier. Jane Dexter. Jim Boblitz. Deanna Matia. Peace Hartford. From Englewood, Florida. Member of Prince of Peace. Emmanuel New London. St. John's Jewel. Good Shepherd, Burton, Michigan. <laughs> Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, Englewood, Florida. It was just amazing to see that man roll up. It, it changed something in my heart after seeing all the destruction for a few days. To these people that maybe don't have church homes, we can show them a little glimpse of what Jesus is like, of his love, and, and his willingness to go out and do without expecting anything in return. The work these volunteers do doesn't require any special skills. The tasks can be as basic as cleaning up brush, fixing a fence, or making a meal. So I thought, if nothing else, I can do painting. I can paint walls. I can paint woodwork. The important thing is that these volunteers are showing love to those in need, and that builds a bond. Plus, it means so much to, to the people. They're so appreciative, and uh, it's genuine. Um, it's not just a thank you. It's rewarding, it's uplifting, it's, it's a positive and, and faith-wise that, that you can't describe until you've actually had a chance to be here. Yeah, what we'll do is get some volunteers and basically just piece... Difficult times tend to eliminate all the extraneous noise of daily life, forcing people to consider what's really important. Get under there and get hurt. That gives these volunteers an opportunity to talk more deeply. She gave up going to church many years ago due to a, a family loss or a loss of a child, and it was an opportunity to sit and talk with her about that a little bit. And I said, "You see, you still do know Christ, and you do know that she that He is there for you." And she said, "I know He keeps me strong." So these these opportunities are everywhere. I can show them that God loves them, and we love them, and we want them to know that no matter how bad it is, the Lord is always with them. Amazing Grace, the Wells Church in Panama City, was hit hard by the hurricane. But the volunteers and resources of Christian Aid and Relief helped the congregation move forward, even in this most difficult time, to coordinate the relief effort and to help connect the volunteer work to the ministry of the congregation. We want to dream with, with members of congregations so that they think outside the box. They actually develop a ministry plan, a plan that they can bring in volunteers with our assistance that can actually help them do this work. And it makes Christ come alive because people have learned that Christ is not just something we read about, Christ is who we are. We live Christ in our life every day. And that's the Bible outreach component of Christian Aid and Relief. It means the world to me for people to, to not forget us and to know we're here. Yes, I would. I would go visit their church in a heartbeat. Wells Christian Aid and Relief is always looking for volunteers. 
you'd like to help on future efforts, even if you have only a week to spare, just go to wells.net forward slash relief. Also check out this month's issue of Forward in Christ magazine to read about how your donations to Wells Christian Aid and Relief helped our sister church in Puerto Rico repair churches and members' homes after a devastating hurricane. There's a bunch of treats uh, in the back, and so we'll close with the commentary prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Come be with us again to, uh, next week as we celebrate Pentecost and the celebration of the Holy Spirit's coming to his disciples. God be with you until we meet again. Uh,